All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Impact at CIIS and the PCC Forum for our third and last collaborative event for this semester. We're honored to have futurist Benjamin J. Butler joining us this evening for an explorative dialogue on our future in human evolution. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the PCC Forum, the PCC Forum is a transdisciplinary lecture series led by the students at the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program here at the California Institute of Integral Studies. The forum encourages contributions from all the programs while giving priority to the PCC masters and PhD students to share and refine their research with the community. The forum also hosts presentations by faculty members, alumni, as well as thinkers, artists, and other creatives outside of the Institute. As an interdisciplinary program, the PCC Forum is excited to be collaborating with IMPACT at CIIS. And for those who are unfamiliar with IMPACT, IMPACT at CIIS is a student group that offers CIIS students with support on IMPACT-oriented projects while creating a space that nourishes integral leadership and creativity in order to build and sustain a community that thrives on transdisciplinary change making. IMPACT's three pillars are salon gatherings, speaker series, and workshop events. Their vision is to have a student-led incubator that provides sustained support and funding to, student who, to students who are utilizing an entrepreneurial toolkit to facilitate and nurture the integral paradigm shift. We are recording this event so that it will be available for the wider community and for those who are unable to join us today. This is going to be an open dialogue, so feel free to unmute yourselves whenever you have a question, comment, or want to share any insights. So I'm going to give us over to Somia to introduce Benjamin. Thanks, Ai. So Benjamin J. Butler is an international futurist, strategist, and philosopher based out of Asia. He left London 20 years ago and has been on the road ever since, accumulating a unique international perspective to advise leaders on where the world might be heading, known for making many prescient forecasts of trends in financial markets, technology, geopolitics, and culture. Benjamin has been a trusted sounding board and advisor on the future for many leaders, coaching them on the important skills and mindset to navigate uncertainty from creativity and imagination to crystallizing purpose and inspiring passion. He draws much inspiration from Zen and Eastern philosophy. He sits on various boards in the capacity of a future thinker and leadership guide, including the Global Future Council on Quantum Computing at the World Economic Forum. Futurist at Horatius Global Futurist Board of the Lifeboat Foundation, the European Institute of Exponential Technologies and Desirable Futures, and the International Advisory Board of Athena School of Management. One of Benjamin's greatest passions has been the pursuit of the holy grail of creativity and the quest for self-realization. Whilst investing in Silicon Valley, he spent a number of years traveling around the world, meeting visionaries, entrepreneurs, creatives, martial artists, and even Zen masters and Himalayan oracles, with the goal of discerning states of mind that lead to insight. Benjamin has been learning and practicing Zen for 20 years and reads and writes Japanese. He believes that the harnessing of collective intelligence could result in another renaissance. So Benjamin, I met you last year at PayPal Innovation Labs Future Explorers Conference in Singapore, and I was absolutely taken away by your presentation. It was just so unique to have someone talk about the intersection of spirituality and economics in a country that I perceive to be still within a materially reductionist paradigm. So really excited to dive deeper into this intersection tonight. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about your background and what inspired you to become a futurist? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I was pleasantly uh, surprised to bump into you in uh, Singapore and uh, end up chatting with you in Japanese for a few moments, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, and uh, um, just on that note, the world, the world is changing, um, even in cities like Singapore, uh, I think there is a, a huge yearning for, for deeper profundity in people's lives, um, even though, you know, people are still caught in the rat race and the sort of materialistic paradigm that there, there is a thirst, I, I believe. And, and there's, there's interesting um, stuff going on in, in Singapore, in, in all the financial cities of the world. Um, my background, God, I hate uh, listening to my own bio, but... Um, 
Um, I always find that a little bit of a, a painful process, but um, um, I, I get excited when I start hearing about going on journeys and uh, and my 20 years wandering um, the, the planet. But basically I was born and bred in the UK. I had a career in finance, um, as, as you know. Um, uh, finance was actually really good for me. Um, in in uh, in not just material uh, things, but um, it uh, I, I saw finance as a um, almost a laboratory of human consciousness. So I had a slight unique pathway through through my financial career, and um, I happened to have a couple, a few good early mentors. One had worked for George Soros and and told me to 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 look at cycles and history. So I went back through and looked at um, Western history through the prism of social trends and, and financial trends. Um, and I started to see patterns in the affairs of humankind. Um, and of course it wasn't popular when I studied economics at university. Uh, it was like a um, cycles were like a, a, a footnote, um, um, almost a laughable footnote um, oh, by the way, there are these crazy people that believe in long-term cycles, like Kondratiev, the Russian economist, who believed in 50-year cycles. And um, uh, it's hilarious when I look back on it, because all the top investors and hedge fund managers I met in the world were always looking at cycles. Um, and of course, business cycles are fairly well accepted, but we, we would look at all sorts of other long-term cycles. And, and I was telling uh, you, Somya, the, the other day that I even knew um, very reputable funds that were looking at astro um, astrology as well, um, not just Indians. Um, um, it's kind of well known that, you know, in India you'll hear about investors using astrology, but um, even in the, the, the city of London and um, uh, other financial centers around the world, they, they, some of them are looking at astrological tr uh, trends. Um, what else was I gonna say? The, the second thing I learned in finance was, um, I guess, the power of the human mind. Um, so George, George Soros wrote a book called Alchemy of Finance. And the, the subtitle of the book was um, Reading the Mind of the Markets. So I was like, what's this mind? And um, I, got some, I got some simple instructions at the beginning of, of my career. I, was, um, I had different roles, but I was, at one point I was supporting this sort of famous fund manager. And um, he was a bit upset that I'd been appointed his counterparty at this investment bank. Um, and um, because I was young, young and clueless, and he wanted a, a veteran to, to help him out. And uh, in the end, he said, well, look, kid, it's not your fault. Um, if you follow some simple advice, then it could be useful for you and it could be useful for me. He said, so what I want you to do is each week speak to as many investors as you can. And just on a piece of paper, just jot down what their thinking process is, what are their themes, what are they thinking about, and, and, and listen as much as you can, and, um, and speak to as wide an array of, of people as you can. And so I would constantly be taking notes and, and really trying to tap into the, the consciousness of, of what people were thinking. And of course, George Soros wrote about how um, if enough people think something, the price of an asset will move in that direction. And then if the price changes, it will actually affect reality itself. And he called it reflexivity. And um, when his book came out, of course, I believe many of the reputable um, newspapers and um, Economist magazine and everyone, um, they all kind of lambasted um, Soros for writing this book because they said, um, look, look, Mr. Soros, we, we know you want to leave your legacy as some philosopher, but, you know, you're just a, you're just a fund manager and investor. Um, um, we wish you'd just tell us how to make money. 
Um, and of course, they, they missed the point that actually that's um, how he was able to, to, to make money was to realize uh, some of these deeper philosophical issues. Um, so anyway, I say all that because it was a, a, a kind of a very bizarre way of, of coming into spirituality. Um, it certainly helped me in my, my current career in, in looking at the future. Um, but uh, it was bizarre at the end of my finance career when I kind of got completely fed up. Not with finance, because I, I always felt that as a career, it was um, intellectually always stimulating because there wasn't a book I couldn't pick up that didn't in some way relate to fight back to finance. Um, like, I mean, I, I read very widely and, you know, at the moment I, I just reread uh, Donut Economics. Um, I'm currently reading Restless Empire about Chinese history. Um, I'm reading uh, Melissa's Octopus and Other Unsuitable Pets. That, that's for my daughter, she's five. Um, but um, apart from the last one, it, pretty much every book I, I would could read could relate to finance in in some way um, because I felt like I was just trying to always pursue truth. What are the trends? What's happening in the world? But there was something missing, um, and I got really depressed. Really went into sort of depression. Um, started drinking too much, um, anaesthetizing. Um, didn't know what the hell was wrong with me, and I realised that there was that I wasn't really far, fully following my soul's work and um, that I needed a, a deeper purpose. Um, so I wouldn't say there's anything innately wrong with most careers. Perhaps uh, I, I don't advise being a drug dealer or arms, arms dealer. And there are a few companies I, I believe are not really helping the world. But um, I also believe you, if you have a deeper purpose, you can, you can be in finance, you can be a barrister, a lawyer or, or whatever, and you can do it in a noble way. And um, I, I don't recommend, when, when people come to me with, in a similar space, they're going through a dark night of the soul. I, I don't necessarily say you have to quit your, your, your current job. Um, it might just be that you do your current job in a more beautiful and, and profound way. In my case, I, had to, I did have to take a step back. Um, so that's when I got deeper. I was living, um, at the time I was living in, um, well, I'd moved out to Japan. Um, I'd studied, um, like you said, I'd, I'd studied Japanese at university. I'd studied law, Japanese, economics. Uh, worked in Tokyo, Hong Kong. Um, in the end, I worked in a number of financial cities, but uh, when, I, when I quit finance full time, I was living in uh, Hong Kong, um, a pearl of the Orient, as they uh, used to call it. Um, and um, that's when I got into venture capital. Um, I, it, was, um, it was quite powerful at the time, getting deeper into, at the time, Zen, and then exploring lots of other forms of spirituality and mysticism. Uh, and at the same time, getting into the world of entrepreneurship, startups, Silicon Valley, uh, and we were investing, we could invest anywhere in the world, but I was investing primarily in the end in California. Um, we, I was on the footsteps of, um, obviously in Hong Kong, I, we could have invested in China, but at the time that the corporate governance was a bit of a challenge, I didn't speak the language fluently, and um, and in the uh, post the GFC crash, uh, there was a, a lot going on in um, in in California and LA as well. Um, we we were quite early in identifying that LA was um, that was going to become another technology hub, not just be well known for Hollywood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, yeah, Silicon Beach was a place we were looking at. Um, I remember telling a, an investor to, to buy blocks and blocks of, uh, uh, of, of Venice, but uh, although he had the capacity to do so at the time, he, he didn't take me up on my offer. So uh, yeah, after venture capital, I, I did a few 
things and then eventually I became what, what I'd call myself today a futurist. Um, so that was a, a little bit of a long-winded way, but um, um, I can tell you what a future is, is kind of. Yes, please do. We want to know what is a futurist. Um, so um, I, in my case, I kind of awoken to the fact that that I was a futurist rather than saying, which is kind of more normal. Most people aspire to be something like I want to be an economist and then they go out and take relevant qualifications and stuff. Um, I also quite like the bold approach of just um, reverse engineering it. So I am an economist. <laughs> what do I need to do? Um, again, showing the power of the mind. And, and I always encourage people um, if they want to shift careers. I think the younger generations um, are more open to doing this. But, um, you, you know, cert certain, I, I guess it can afflict all of us. But um, anyway, we, we think we need to go out and get loads and loads of qualifications and et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we're now living in a world where we're interconnected um, a, an unprecedented, in an unprecedented way, you can learn online in a remarkable fashion. Um, and the pace of change is so phenomenal that you can, if you put your mind to it, you can become almost an expert in, in so many fields in a matter of um, months to a certain extent in certain fields. I mean, if you, uh, if you take industries like uh, blockchain, if you spent 24 seven um, studying uh, blockchain for, for six months, um, because things are changing so quickly, you could actually be up there as, a, as almost a thought leader in six to 12 months if, if you're smart. So, so we're in a remarkably interesting period of human history. Whereas if you were, born in a, an earlier generation um, to become an expert in a field, you need 10 years experience. Um, people wouldn't take you seriously if you didn't have 10, 15 years experience. Um, so we're, in, we're living in really interesting times. Anyway, um, for, for me, I, um, yeah, the, the, the genesis of me becoming a futurist was, was kind of funny, but I'll, um, I'll skip that for the for the moment. But what what is a futurist? Um, a few, of course, for thousands of years, and probably since the the birth of civilization, um, some people think it was Mesopotamia. If you talk to people like Graham Hancock, then it was probably earlier. And if you talk to some people like Rudolf Steiner, if he was around today, um, they would say that that. He, that civilization's been around for a hell of a lot longer than we, um, um, our textbooks suggest. Uh, I'm actually in that camp, by the way. Um, but ever since civilization existed, people look forward to the future. You had philosophers, advisors to the kings, the queens, the emperors, empresses, to the village, the shaman was looking forward into the, the future. Um, so uh, I guess in a way the career has been around for a long time. Um, you know, if you look at my own country, the genesis um, uh, of um, like the British Empire. Um, you know, of course, it's kind of controversial today about how much uh, good, good it did. But um, the, the idea of the British Empire was, was, um, came from a, a sort of a futurist called John Dee who most British people don't even know, know who he is. Um, he was an astrologer and an advisor to uh, Queen Elizabeth. And um, he apparently had the, the most uh, extensive library and esoteric library um, outside Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and um, uh, I guess he was an alchemist uh, as well, but a very broad thinker um, and looked to the future. In fact, um, I think he was Prospero the magician in uh, in Shakespeare's uh, uh, The Tempest. 
Um, but uh, of course, most people don't know who he is today. Um, but if you if you look at um, and of course, like in ancient China, you had the divination and the I Ching, and in India, you have um, uh, uh, all sorts of folk that were will look into the future. But if you look at modern futures, they like to call it now. Um, the genesis could have been um, H.G. Wells um, when he made a famous talk at the Royal Institution in uh, Mayfair, London. And uh, I think it was called Discovery of the Future. And um, he, um, he said uh, a whole, he'd written a series of articles forecasting things about the future. Um, but he also said, uh, and, and his voice got louder and louder over the decades, but he, he said that um, just like we have professors of history, we need professors of the future. And, um, and that there is a certain knowability of the future. Um, but interestingly, also spoke about the two different types of minds, the, 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 the subordinate mind, which accepted things as, as they were, but then the creative mind, the legislative mind, uh, it's one of the words he used, that the mind that can create the future. Um, and he alluded to that as well. And uh, so some people mark him as one of the earliest, the sort of grandfather of modern day uh, futures or futurism. Um, um, and then, and then um, it, I mean, I write about this in my book, uh, as a chapter, the, the history of the future. But um, essentially, you had some interesting thinking coming out of the US military um, with the Rand Corporation down in um, Southern California, Santa Monica. There was a, a strategist, uh, Herman Kahn, who started doing scenario analysis. Um, and that was taken into the corporate world by um, Pierre, Pierre Wack at Shell. And um, but, so he started introducing uh, um, futures work and scenario work into Shell Corporation. So they, um, they avoided the, the, the harshest impact of the oil shock uh, because of his work. And you can read, you can read about his work in um, Harvard Business Review. Um, he writes um, an article, what was it called? Um, there was a cool phrase. Um, the reperception of it was about reperception, and um, anyway, I mean the the field developed. I, I think it came out of a, a marriage between science fiction, military strategy, and and then this sort of transdisciplinary body of knowledge um, called futures was, was born, and uh, it went from future to futures. Interestingly, so a lot of the people in the military. Um, and I probably had this inclination in my finance career. Um, they would talk about the future. And then um, the, as, as the field got developed and um, a program was set up at Hawaii, um, the university there, um, Clear Lake, Houston in the US, and then some programs in Europe. And of course, um, you had bodies like the Club of Rome appeared, which were really important for the, um, the ecological movement. Um, all these bodies started to appear and then they started, um, I think partly the, the, because of the Europeans, but they started talking about futures instead of the future. And um, so it became futures studies. So there's the world futures uh, studies, um, Society or Federation, um, which came out of Paris. And um, so the notion of futures was that there, instead of one voice dominating or colonizing the future, the future is something that we can co-create, co-imagine. Co and uh, yes, we might be moving in one direction. Um, in, in There's lots of tools and methodologies in, in the study of futures, but there's a futures cone so if you imagine a cone and in the middle of the cone is the most probable future, um, you have concentric circles. And so you have 
um, what they call prob probable, possible, uh, uh, and preferable futures. And there's a few others. And so uh, a job of a futurist is to consider these um, different possibilities and, and hopefully uh, champion a preferable or a desirable um, future. Um, so that was my long, long winded way of talking a little bit about what a, a futurist is. But um, for me personally, I, I'm quite, I guess, inspired to just help people open their mind to, to what's, what's possible. And um, I can, so I sometimes get dragged back into the prediction space, which, um, you know, I have a few tools and, and techniques and, um, and some of them come from Zen, which helped me uh, on occasion to, to successfully forecast the future. But, um, you know, that, that's also a, a, a bit of a dangerous trade. I, I also prefer to, to operate in this other space uh, as well, which is more open. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question or you have a follow up. Yeah, it, it totally does. And, and I would be, you know, curious to know, like, what, well, how do you see the future? Like, is it from your lens and all the analysis that you do? What is your take on the near future and the far future? Well, um, that's a, a tricky question. Um, of course, things depend on time frames and all sorts, but we are, um, we're going through a massive transition at the moment. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, we're right in the middle of it. And um, it's, um, it's fascinating that there's a, a, a complete array of people that look looked at the future and we all look, we all saw 2020 as a massive turning point long before COVID uh, came on, on the scene. Um, of course, we, we knew after the GFC, the, the, the great financial crisis of 08, 09, um, well, really it was 06 to 09. Um, I think the media like to talk about 08, 09, um, but because most people missed most of the most of the journalists and most of the economists missed the beginning, but it was fairly obvious in two thousand and six the whole system was was cratering as the U.S. housing market collapsed, and you had all these um, toxic uh, mortgage-backed securities and stuff. Anyway, all these financial shenanigans. Um, so it, the 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 world economy was like a wounded duck back in 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 those years, and we were basically living on borrowed time. Um, and, um, and of course you had the 2012 um, where a number of the world's um, religions uh, and, and civilizations that had a, a very high rate of accuracy at looking at, at certain shifts uh, in, uh, in trends and things uh, saying that 2012 was gonna be a turning point and um, the, the, the late futurist Barbara Marx Hubbard um, really celebrated 2012 as, as the birth of a, a, new, a new civilization. Um, but of course, for a new civilization to emerge, the, the old has to, has to break down, that the old world has to disappear. So lots of people like using the word the new earth. Um, I guess Eckhart Tolle wrote his, his book, uh, The New Earth, which is quite a kind of inspiring, but um, the old earth has to break down. And, and so that's what we're seeing at the moment, um, that the driving forces are, the two big ones possibly are the, the ecological crisis and, and secondly, um, uh, so social cohesion in, in the Western world. Uh, maybe you could add to that, um, technology and, and fourthly, maybe um, the emergence of China and Asia. Um, but um, the, the world's been really shaken up. But um, so when people say to me, are you positive or negative? Um, I say, well, it depends what you're looking at. So if you're looking at, a, if you're looking at an ecosystem um, and in this like 
say vibrant forest, you've got a bunch of old oak trees that are dying uh, and crashing down. Um, if you're looking at those oak trees, um, you, you could think the world's ending. Um, but um, so you could mourn the dying of the oak trees, but you could also look at all the green shoots that are, are growing, all the saplings uh, that couldn't grow because they were being blocked from the sunlight by these big old trees. And, and um, that's kind of where we are. So we're in a bit of um, some grand transition, which I'd characterize as the end of the industrial age uh, and the birth of something new, which presumably will come up with a new word when the, the time is right. But it's not the fourth industrial revolution as my colleagues at the World Economic Forum like to call it. Um, um, the, the, the World Economic Forum does some interesting work and, and I've got many great friends there, but um, the, the word industrial revolution bugs the hell out of me because we, uh, we don't need another industrial revolution. And I actually, I had, um, had coffee with uh, Fridjof Capra in, um, in Berkeley in 20, 2015. And, uh, um, and actually, I think on YouTube, there's still a couple of conversations we, we had together. But I, I said to him, what do you think of the fourth industrial revolution? And uh, he, he said, I think it will be a disaster. <laughs> um, um, that's not to say that uh, the reason I'm picking up on that is because language is important. And um, yes, some of the stuff that World Economic Forum and the, the Chinese have, have been using that word as well. But um, yes, some of the technologies that the World Economic Forum is talking about, like that, that they think is under the umbrella of the fourth industrial revolution are important, um, robotics, AI, spatial computing, uh, drone technology, all sorts, all, all of these technologies can be used for, for the greater good and, and they're important. But to, to me, the paradigm is really important. The language is important. Um, um, you know, we, we need a new story. Um, industrial doesn't, doesn't fit the world we're, that's trying to emerge at the moment. It's, um, to me, it's a very dead word, mechanistic. Um, we need uh, references to life, to biology, to ecology. So I, I think we're moving into a, um, an ecological civilization. I think it wasn't it. I think Thomas Berry was, would say that we're living between two stories at the moment. Um, and uh, I think compared to when he was saying this several decades ago, we're, we're much more evolved now in, in that. So. The word I use is a, an, an ecological civilization. But, uh, you know, I tell my technologist friends that doesn't mean, uh, you know, it's just about being green. It's, it, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's, um, it's about, um, I guess, I guess at the deeper level, realizing that we belong to nature and nature doesn't belong to us, to use the words of um, Chief, Chief Seattle. Um, but um, it's that yeah that we're embedded in nature. The economy comes from nature. I mean, I mean this is a, a donut economics is a groundbreaking book um, because when I was at university, it was I, I found it a pretty hopeless subject. Um, apart from the sort of specialist ones, like when I studied the history of Japanese economy, that was fascinating and useful for my career but a lot of the macroeconomic courses I thought were, were hopeless but uh, it's amazing how macroeconomics is being completely rethought and, and donut economics is now being adopted by uh, a number of um, countries in, um, in Holland and um, I think the prime, um, president, prime minister of um, Ireland um, also has embraced it. Um, but this notion of an ecological civilization, I see it everywhere in, in, in the way we're thinking in, in our new, if you look at the forefront um, of pretty much every field, to me, it seems ecological. 
So in technology, the new, techno the new advanced technologies have attributes of decentralization, networks, self-organization. Um, to me, that's nature. That's how nature operates. If you look at the forefront of how organizations are developing, you know, organizational development, um, self-organizing systems, again, are at the forefront. You know, you've got holo holocracy, um, you've got um, Frederick Lalu wrote a, a, great, a great book uh, back in 2014 um, about uh, called Reinventing Organizations. And, and again, he said, we, um, in fact, the introduction is written by Ken Wilber. Um, and uh, he says that uh, just like there are levels of consciousness for human beings, organizations have levels of consciousness. And so um, a lot of organizations were trying to move from um, orange to green, which is kind of the meritocratic type of companies like an investment bank to a green company um green using his levels of consciousness that is um not green as in environmental um uh, moving to this level of consciousness which is the 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 metaphor is like the family and uh the focus of the these companies is is on um some mission so if you look around at a lot of the companies in, in America today at, at the cutting edge, many of them are moving towards green. And then if you look at the really cutting edge companies, they're, they're moving to the teal level um, where the metaphor is, um, uh, is more nature. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I could go on about this, but um, to really answer your question, uh, am I positive about the future? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, but we, we, we're experiencing the, both the amazingness of going into this new world and, and this living at this moment as significant as the Renaissance, um, probably a lot more significant, probably that there have been a couple of phase shifts in the history of of humanity um, without looking at the history of our planetary history. But if you look at the history of humanity, um, the first could be the, the shift, uh, could be the shift, um, the agricultural revolution and the, and the birth of civilization, um, going from hunter gatherers uh, into, into, into cities uh, and the birth of, I guess, the written language. And then secondly, uh, would be the industrial revolution and um, the, the, um, where we began in, in the UK with uh, Thomas Newcomen in 1712 in Dartmouth, um, discovering that we could harness the power of, of, of the, I guess, the, the old energy of the sun through coal and, and the steam engine. And, um, you know, to, to, to borrow an idea from physics, you have like phase transitions, like from water to steam. Um, and um, I think we're going through one of those, but uh, it's gonna be a hell of a turbulent path. I mean, I, I, uh, I predicted that the UK would go through Brexit and, and leave the European Union, that Donald Trump would be elected in the United States, that there would be a constitutional crisis in, in America, that there would be, um, possibly revolutions and coup d'etats, that borders could change, that um, we'd have trouble with pandemics, um, uh, we'd have further economic crises um, along the way, but in the midst of that, um, uh, a huge amount of, of hope. And um, whilst all this volatility is happening, um, you've got uh, people out there building this, this new world. Sorry, my answers, I don't know if they're too uh, long-winded. No, they're, they're great. Thank you so much, Benjamin. And, uh, you know, I, I have a follow-up question on, on um, something you just mentioned about the ecological um, uh, civilization that we're heading into. 
you know, I mean, as someone who, who comes from a financial background, I'm wondering what, what role you think finance will play in this ecological civilization. And, and um, my second question is, uh, is related to money. And I, you know, philosophically speaking, I would love to know, you know, what, what is money to you? Um, and and how, how can we change our relationship to it so that it doesn't seem uh, like, you know, we have to be in conflict with it? How can we not be in conflict with money? Mm. Okay, two tough questions, but good questions. Um, uh, I'll start off with the easier one, which is the individual. Um, I think, I think that if you, if you focus on your life purpose um, and what your soul yearns to do whilst you're in this life, um, it generally will be something that gives you great joy, but also in service of greater humanity. I remember asking, um, um, so Bill, Bill Plotkin is a, a wonderful vision quest guide and um, um, uh, I guess a, men, a, a, a mentor of mine in, in, in a sense, I, I've done some work with him and he, um, um, he likes to talk about the mythopoetic identity that everyone has. And so I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I'm, I am answering your question on money. But, um, and so I've led vision quests as well, where the, the goal is to find one's mythopoetic identity. What, you know, your, what is your soul's work? And um, I think if you focus on that deeper stuff, um, you'll find your, your niche within humanity. Because I remember asking him once, uh, so what, what do you define soul as? Um, and he said, oh, it's your ecological niche. And at first I thought, that's a really strange answer, an ecological niche. I thought he was going to say something a bit more poetic because his books are very poetically written. You know, he's inspired um, by, you know, the romantic poets and, um, uh, you know, he lo likes Carl Jung and all these guys as well, but he has a very poetic way of writing. And he said a, an ecological niche. And, and I thought about it for a long time. And I thought, well, actually, that's true. It's we all have a place in this world, uh, a unique place. And if we if we sing our song um, or um, sing the music that's within us, to borrow a term from Wayne Dyer, um, um, uh, the money will flow in, resources will flow in, people will support you. And um, I, I, my relationship with money is very, very much um, shifted. Of, of course, in finance, it's very easy to make, um, or any career, make money the goal. Um, thankfully, it didn't corrupt me too much uh, in the day I, I, because I was so fascinated by what was going on in the world um, that I was really inspired by my, my by my job but um but now I'm, I'm focused more on my mission and I, I think um you just see um I know it's very new agey to say it but um I'm gonna say it anyway see see the money as, as a as an energy an energy um or just a, a resource um and it doesn't have to corrupt your mind um I read a, a great book by, um, what was it? Um, I've forgotten his name, um, and I know him, um, uh, Sujith, and I've forgotten his surname, but he, he, he wrote a book, something like The Seven um, Mystical Laws of Abundance. And it's, uh, it's an amazing book because it goes back through Vedas and sutras and stuff um, from India. And, and talks about one's relationship with, with money. And uh, again, he talks about um, if you find your life uh, purpose, um, the abundance will, um, will flow in. I don't know if that, that answers. I mean, I know it's a really tough time at the moment. I appreciate that with, with, with COVID. I mean, all, all my public talks got canceled. You know, I got 
um, slammed by by the whole thing. And um, I know it's a tough time, but the, it's it's tough waking up in the morning focused only on money. I, I really believe if you find your life purpose, you, you've got three hundred percent more energy and vitality to get out and do things. Um, and of course, the the demographics are such the younger and, and younger generations are demanding meaning and, and purpose uh, in in the workplace. So you're more likely to find your tribe. Um, money might disappear, who knows, if we become a, a Star Trek type civilization, you know, with um, you know, we might take one step towards that with universal basic income. That that will enable people to 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 at least have the basics covered. So then you don't have to freak out um, that you're going to become homeless. Um, that that at least you can have food, shelter, and medicine. Um, that could be a, a good stepping stone to uh, some sort of more advanced civilization has to be done intelligently because governments often are corrupt and uh, an authoritarian government could easily switch off your universal basic income if if uh, if you weren't politically correct which um, would be a disaster um, so it would if they introduce it it has to be like a constitutional right and it can't be sort of switched off um, and the second the question was about a what, what was the second question about the where, where do I think the system is is going? The the role of finance in an ecological civilization. Yeah, I mean, I mean that I, I think finance is going kind of green already, um, and the business world is moving to a multi stakeholder approach. So I think for the time being, finance can move in in the right. Uh, in, in a better direction. Um, um, what, what else can I add? What, what, um, I mean, the system has to be uh, reformed, clearly. Um, I would abolish central banks, for example, um, because I, I think we've just been debasing the value of the, the currencies and we just keep getting more and more into debt so we need a new Bretton Woods um, for for the 21st century um, so finance can exist but it you know since the 1980s um, I think Thatcher and Reagan did lots of good things uh, and I, I think they had good intentions but we, we've seen a, a globalization and a financialization of the, the world economy and um, I think when finance is at the forefront and dominates everything, that's a problem. It, it should be in support of other industries. So when I was in finance in 2007, I was looking at, I was looking at the composition of the S&P 500. And um, I think it was about 60 to 70% of the earnings of the S&P 500, that the biggest stocks um, in the US, uh, all came from finance and the oil and gas industry. And I thought that was insane, absolutely insane. Um, of course, it's not there, it's not like that today, but um, um, I, I think we need smaller, a, a lot more smaller companies that are competing against each other with probably different um, mission statements. And then, of course, you've got blockchain and Bitcoin. And um, I, I think these decentralized technologies could be um, hugely empowering for the for the individual in terms of um, transparency, but also privacy. Um, um, and um, Bitcoin, who knows, is that going to become the new global currency in, um, in, a, in a couple of decades time? Because it's not going to be the dollar, that's for sure. Many, many people speculate it's going to be the IMF's currency that already has a currency, a 
which is a basket of currencies. Some people think that's going to be the new um, global reserve currency, but um, um, I think it's still insane in in an age where I I can I can instantaneously message you uh, or have a video call with you, and I can have so much interconnection with people around the planet that it can take me days to send a wire transfer from the UK to Hong Kong. Um, and the fees that I have to pay are insane. So um, that needs to change. Um, I don't know if that answers it. It's, it's a very, very broad topic. We, I mean, we could spend the hour and a half just talking about finance and that that might not be useful for uh, people at CIS. Well, you never know, but um, it was you know, always really interesting to, you know, talk about that intersection of, of finance and, and evolution. I don't know, uh, I, if you have any questions or if anyone else has any questions for Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit to um, what you were saying earlier, you talked about um, you know, the things are changing, there is a death happening that needs to happen so that you can have that rebirth um, and this emergence of the Asian countries. And I was curious to see what you think of uh, what countries are going to make it or what countries are going to have just drastic changes. Um, or is it going to be more global? Is there even going to be countries anymore? Yeah, good point. I mean, in the chapter of my book about the future of geography, it starts off, um, it's a dialogue, um, the, the book, but it starts off talking about, okay, well, if, if you were to apply a normal framework of a competitive framework of geopolitics, which countries are gonna do well and, and which won't. And of course, um, I do believe China's on, on the ascendance. Um, I've, I've had front row seats since China joined the WTO in, back in 2001 and two. Um, their momentum has slowed, of course, um, and you've got this sort of geopolitical friction now between the US uh, and China. But um, um, I think um, we could talk a lot about that, but um, I think the West made a lot of mistakes in, in, in its relations with with China, um, but China's rise is irrevocable now. It's been the sleeping dragon, and it's uh, awoken, and and they have very long term thinking. Um, in in our quantum group at the World Economic Forum, we were chatting the other day about how they 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 have visions out to twenty eighty on quantum technology and white warp speed speed drives and all sorts of crazy sci-fi like technologies and they imagine it and then backcast it and um, um they they've made that it seems like they've made the leap in terms of technology to a to to um i don't know what the word is but um i guess uh, some people would characterize china's growth um up until let's say 2010 is sort of copying technologies from uh, from the West, but uh, they're, they're definitely not there now. They're, they're trying to be at the forefront of a lot of the new technologies, AI and um, quantum, et cetera. Um, I think, um, I think it's interesting. It, it, so Asia's clearly for the last, Actually, who are Shashi Theroux, who I'm interviewing in a couple of weeks' time, who was a candidate to be um, Secretary General of the, the UN, is an amazing uh, thinker and writer. Um, I think it was him that said, um, uh, no, it wasn't actually, I'm totally misquoting, I think it was Kishore, Kishore Mabubani. Um, it was a senior diplomat in Singapore and a great geopolitical thinker. I was on a panel with him the other day and he he said, look, for the last, out of the last 2000 years, um, uh, Asia's been the sort of dominant 
uh, economy in the world for all but a, a couple of hundred years. And uh, we're moving back to that norm. And um, so that means India, um, but of, of course, um, India's on the right trajectory, but needs um, some things need, need to happen. Um, but but I, I like to see India as, as not, not just uh, strong in, in terms of um, its economic potential, but in terms of like being a spiritual superpower and um, what, what can India add to the global conversation about the future of humanity. Um, and I think China can add there as well. Um, we, we, we always think of China in terms of economy and technology, but um, um, if we're co-creating this new, new civilization, then um, what, what's the new paradigm? And I think um, being a, a student of Zen for, for half my life, um, that's where Zen originally came from. Of course, um, people would say it originally came from Buddhism and obviously out of India and Nepal, but um, Zen is sort of an innovation of the, or the esoteric arm of, of Buddhism. And um, that, that, was, that permeates uh, Chinese philosophy and, and definitely Japanese and Korean philosophy. Um, but I'm trying, trying to go back to your original question. Um, I, you know, I, I could pinpoint countries that I think will do well, countries that are struggling. I think the Korean peninsula is fascinating. The Korean people are incredibly creative, um, uh, very spiritually minded, actually. Um, um, but um, they, they've, um, they've kind of adopted this very industrious uh, Confucian thinking um, in recent years, but they also have this very creative dimension. And I think when Korea gets reunified, they're, they're going to be an amazing uh, country. Um, Australasia, um, if Europe, I mean, here's, here's a, 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 a kind of out of the box uh, scenario, but if, if Europe doesn't get its act together and ever, uh, in, implodes, then you'll see um, mass migration from Europe to um, Australasia, like Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, I think the biggest dangers in the in the West is there's great thinking. Um, the the dangers are political, and um, um, when people have said to me, "Do you believe in a?" Do you believe there's going to be a third world war or a fourth world war? Because the Cold War, some people would characterize as World War III. Um, I, I, in the last 10 years, I've been saying no. Of course, there's a, a possibility of a world war. Um, but what I think is more likely is civil war in, in, in the West. And um, you, you've seen that in the United States, where you've got very much a clash of cultures within um, within the West, two, two, two different stories, and unfortunately, a, a media in between that doesn't try and bring people together, they just create more division and friction. Um, and so instead of bringing people to the table in dialogue, um, it's just getting worse and worse. And so that you can't even, you know, bring a Democrat and a Republican together in, in many cases in, in the States, which is very sad. If you, if you read the book, The Great Turning, I don't know if, if um, you're aware of that book. Um, so Joanna Macy would, talks about The Great Turning uh, a lot, um, who I've also met, um, wonderful human, human being. I think she was she involved in CIS at one point. Yeah, yeah, she she was, and um, Sean Kelly actually teaches the Great Turning every, every spring. Um, I think I is taking that class next semester, and I did, and Abir already did. I think Matt Teresi. I took it with, I took it with Joanna Macy. She used to teach. She was a core faculty for a, quite a few years. I'd say. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, of course, she was a, a Buddhist scholar and looks at these big issues and. Um, um, if you read David Corton's book, The Great Turning, he, there, there's a section of his book which 
it's incredibly long and it's a list it's a list of um, phrases that all Americans agree upon regardless of political affiliation and when when you read that it's like oh my god there's so much that Americans can can get together on and I, I think um, sorry to bash the media but I I, I think uh, of course the the political parties have been both parties have been terrible at not bringing people together and I um, mean it's I mean looking at the future of the nation state etc um, it's amazing witnessing what's going on in the west from Asia because people are even thinking do we even want democracy <laughs> in some countries like China if that's what happens um, and of course of course, I don't think what what we have in many uh, nations, and and I'm, I don't want to just bash the U.S. I mean, I love actually, I love love the U.S. I love spending time in the U.S. and I've thought about moving out there many times. Um, the U.K. has a, a huge problem as as well. Um, we don't really have a, a full democracy. That's that's part of the problem. Um, you know, we have politicians that are. Their, what their primary concern has to be the, the, the benefactors that write the checks to them, um, whether that's Wall Street, the military industrial complex, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we don't really have a, a democracy and then you have a, a, a completely inept mainstream media. Um, of course, now with the internet, you can get access to amazing information through blogs and individual tweets and stuff, but um, Going back to your 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 question, um, you know, I, I I see I also see the the rebirth of the the Silk Road the Silk Roads and Eurasia as something which is quite encouraging. Uh, and if you if you look at the new technologies like uh, Hyperloop, where um, the Rand Corporation came up with the idea and then Elon Musk popularized it, um, and of course he was already doing so many things, he couldn't start a company, but a couple of companies ran with them, the, the paper that Elon Musk wrote. Um, and um, I think there was a test case of the Hyperloop um, operating in Korea last week at a thousand kilometers per hour. And so um, it's fascinating how you could have these high-speed trains going across the continent of uh, Eurasia and people you know my generation we didn't really talk about Eurasia but that word is is coming back I mean think how big that supercontinent is it's it's almost like Pangaea um, and um, the the Chinese of course have been talking about the the, the Silk Roads um, and and uh, the Russians have always wanted to talk about Eurasia because they they span uh, Europe on one hand with St. Petersburg and uh, Vladivostok, which is part of Asia on, on the other. Um, so Eurasia is coming back, that, that's for sure. Um, and um, w will the nation state disappear? I mean, I did an interview with um, some, uh, a friend at, uh, gosh, is it Bit Nation? Uh, Bit Nation. And um, we were talking about the, um, the the nation state being in its death throes, and um, I, um, of course, you, you look at nationalism in Europe and the U.S. in the last few years, and you might say, well, the nation state is making a massive comeback. But um, I, if you go back to my predict, I mean, it's a it's a hope and it's a prediction that we're shifting to an ecological civilization. And, and it's one of my forecasts that I know I'm going to be right um, because of one simple fact. If I'm not right, then we, Stephen Hawking and all these others will be right. The human race will go extinct. <laughs> so, well, in a way, we don't have a choice. Um, so I, we are moving that way, which means our, our governance is going to become more... Um, uh, hopefully uh, 
but probably more decentralized and self-organized, which means cities and even villages are, are going to become more and more influential uh, and, and power is going to come down. And of course, bodies like the UN maybe could get stronger in terms of um, their ability to coordinate. Um, I'm not sure about this idea of a one world government and I, I'm really not sure about the United Nations sort of running the, 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 the planet. I, I, I just don't believe in command and control. It didn't work in USSR. Um, they, 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 they say it's working in, in, in China at the moment, but I don't know. I, I ultimately think we have to shift to a, um, a greater democracy, really, bringing power back down to the people. It's really inspiring, actually, if you listen, if you read about towns around the world that have taken back power. So in the UK, there was um, a little village in Somerset, um, I say village, town, uh, not far from my parents' home, um, Frome. And um, there's a book written by the mayor of the town about what happened, uh, a book called Flat Pack Democracy. And um, essentially there was 11, 12 councillors up for election and uh, a group of independents came in that weren't affiliated with any political party. And uh, they kicked out all of the um, um, those affiliated with the, the, the three major UK parties, and um, they they really brought in the whole town to co-create and co-imagine what their new town would look like, and um, um, they did some amazing things. I showed up at a, a Californian friend of mine who actually did a lot of work with Joanna Macy. She um, she got so inspired by, by it, she went and camped out there for three or four months over the summer a few years ago and um, um, uh, invited me there. And I, I went to some um, event, I can't remember what it was, some summer event. Um, and uh, there was some play and all sorts going on. And um, it was such a vibrant community uh, feel and, and people felt empowered to change things. Um, so. Um, I think that's the that's the future, but um, I, I'm I'm interested to be interviewing Shashi Theroux in a couple of weeks' time because he he was um, um, he could have been Secretary General of the United Nations and um, some the the conspiracy theory is that he didn't win it. Um, in fact, even though he was a friend of the United States, the U.S. vetoed him. Um, so I don't know who that would have been. 2009, would that have been Obama? It was probably Obama actually. Um, but anyway, he got, he got vetoed, but um, um, the conspiracy is that he was too strong a leader, too charismatic and too strong a leader to be secretary general of the UN because the big nations don't like a strong leader um, at the UN. Uh, and Kishore Mababani was complaining about that. Um, on a panel that we did the other day. So I don't know if that kind of answers the, the question, um, but um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it's not, for, for years we lived under empires and then it became the nation state after Westphalia and, and there's gonna be something different going forwards. And um, I have faith in uh, biomimicry and, and, and evolution. So I, I think fast forward a hundred years, we're gonna start looking a little bit more like the ants and the termites um, uh, and, um, uh, and the way ecology grows. Um, I mean, think, think also like the biggest revolution in, let's call it making or manufacturing really since the dawn of humankind. Um, think about 2001 Space space Odyssey, you know, at the beginning of, of the first scene is the dawn of man and we discover a, 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 our first tool. And, um, you know, we have these tools and how do we make our tools? Um, we take a lump of a material and we chop bits off it. 
Um, that's how we've been making things. Of course, we've got advanced machinery now and we've got advanced um, uh, forms of uh, energy and we've had the industrial revolution, but we still chop bits off a lump of something until additive printing, 3D printing. It's the first time, it's like the, the replicator, is it, in Star Trek? But essentially, we're creating something inside out. So the same way that a tree grows. Um, to me, that's absolutely astonishing and fascinating. And, and, and things like that, um, I'm, I'm not one of these techno, techno optimists, but that's one of those technologies that can be hugely efficient um, compared to all the waste of chopping bits off. Um, uh, but philosophically, it's fascinating to me because, again, it just confirms that we're moving closer um, to, to nature. So it's the same answer for the, you know, the future of the nation state and the question you asked, Aya. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, I know we're, we're coming close to 7.30 now, so I just want to make sure that uh, if anyone else has a question for Benjamin, uh, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, ben, I, I really appreciated your talk, and um, I think uh, in terms of, um, you know, certainly what I know about um, well, you mentioned uh, reverse engineering the future, which I thought was um, interesting. And I was just curious if you might uh, spend some time talking about uh, that process as you see it and, and maybe some of the, um, um, not only, you know, uh, politics and, and um, ethics behind it, but also uh, the, maybe the aesthetic dimension um, of, of kind of, um, what you um, are trying or, or would like to, or, um, you know, there's a, there's a dismal possibility if, if sort of all of this goes south, um, but then there's sort of predicting the future because uh, you're sort of building it in the present. Um, and so I'm wondering how you, um, how you speak to that and, um, you know, some of, some of uh, that alchemy and, and where you're um, maybe going for that. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, towards the beginning, there's a, um, there's a little bit of a tug of war between forecasting and predicting the future and then creating the future. And um, in, in a way, in I think on my website, I've got my alternative resume, where is a little bit of my life story. Um, and I, it's like in my own life, I go through phases where there's the phase of in finance, I was just trying to predict the future. And then I started investing in California startups and I'm trying to create the future. And now I'm back in the middle, I believe in in looking at both and when I talk to um, I mean I coach a lot of leaders who are I think are artisans of the future I, um, they um, I talk about surfing and um, I'm not a surfer actually um, I, I already had a heavy addiction to skiing and, and snow sports and sometimes that hobby would take up two thirds of my year because I'd go skiing every single weekend and then I'd be living in the northern hemisphere and then I'd We'd go into the summer and um, I'd fly into the Southern Hemisphere and go skiing in New Zealand or South America. And I thought if I took up surfing as well, then I'd be totally screwed and I wouldn't have a career because I'd just become a, 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 snow, a snow bum and a, a, ski, um, and a sur surfer. But um, it's a sport I imagine I'd get completely hooked on. But um, I, when I look at the future, I, I kind of look at surfing as an interesting metaphor in that, um, so there are these waves that are coming in, like mega trends, um, and it's very, very beneficial 
to understand that topography of the ocean. However, you can surf these waves in, in beautiful ways and you have complete free will to manifest within those, those trends. Can you change the trend? Well, you can probably even do that as well. Um, you know, I, I believe we're all, to use your word, I believe you, we're all alchemists. And in, in fact, um, in the first chapter of my book, I, I, I talk about how um, there, there, was a, there was a quote from, um, uh, gosh, uh, oh, Lovelock, of course, James Lovelock, um, um, who coined Gaia theory, who said in his, um, his book, uh, Rough, Rough Ride to the Future, he, he said um, that um, humankind is like a, the sorcerer's apprentice. Uh, and um, we've kicked off, we've kind of meddled with the magic of the universe and essentially instigated a, a series of unstoppable events. Um, and, and in my book, uh, The Futurist, um, that there's a, a part where, which says we, we now need to wake up and become the true sorcerers and alchemists or wizards that we, we really are. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we can do so much to, to create the future. And um, it's a topic at the moment, very close to my heart because we're in, um, we're kind of in a stealth mode on a, uh, on a project that will be announced very soon called uh, Embassy of the Future. Um, and um, we, we're doing something where we want to encourage sort of these artisans of, of the future. And I think we're all potential artisans of, of the future. So I don't know if that answers the question, but there, there was a futurist, Barbara Marks Hubbard, who I never got to meet, but we have um, had many mutual friends. She passed away sadly in 2019, but she, she was um, an interesting person to read. She, she wrote a book called Conscious Evolution. And um, I think she was the first woman to get, um, did she get, I don't know whether she won, I think she was on the ticket to be vice president for um, the Democrat party decades, decades ago. And she was a futurist. Um, and um, she always thought a futurist's job really was to, to be a messenger from the future. Um, and in a way, I, I believe, and as my book will talk about that we're all futurists, we, we can all be emissaries of the future if we, if we tap into our, our deeper level of consciousness. So um, and I think Rudolf Steiner, thinkers like that would, would say, say the same thing. In a way, I was talking to a friend, uh, a fellow, I guess a fellow futurist and mystic who's hiding up in the Pyrenees in Spain, but um, he, uh, he said, futurists are really, um, their job is to embody the future. And um, I think that's what we all need to be doing at the moment. But I'm 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 still good to do another ten minutes if if you have any last questions, Sonia. Yeah, I just want to make sure anyone else doesn't want doesn't have any questions for Benjamin. Okay. Yeah, well. I, I I could ask a question. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like you've had a chance to meet a lot of people involved in politics and different futurists who have different approaches. How is, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, field. It's, it's an interesting calling, right? It's an interesting vocation to be a futurist. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the few different archetypes of futurists that you come across and your sense of the varying credibility of different approaches. So. You, for example, you mentioned you have a very intuitive approach grounded in Zen. I know that there's a lot of, you know, hardcore data scientist type people trying to predict things as well. Um, so what's, what's your sense on that? The few different competing approaches or, you know, this field as it evolves, the, the dialectic that's happening there. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, it is a broad church. Um, and I, I would, I would include, for me, I'd include science fiction writers as futurists. Um, I think it's a very useful, very useful trade for, for someone to open their mind and look at the future in a, a quite holistic manner, because you have to imagine what life is going to be like, um, rather than just imagine one narrow area of, of life. And it, it's amazing how many science fiction writers actually have uh, have been actually very useful in, in even predicting the future, but at least opening people's minds to um, some of the important debates and dilemmas uh, like today, artificial intelligence and, and the, the huge benefits of it, but also the, the dangers, the real dangers of AI if it's, if we got, if we get to sort of um, super AI and it's unleashed. But um, so I'd include science fiction um, that there's, uh, I mean, a lot of futurists nowadays don't like the idea that their job is to just predict. Um, so a lot of the work that came out of the military and out of places like Rand, et cetera, et cetera, originally was all about prediction. And there's still lots of people out there. There's obviously the uh, Tetlock, and he wrote this book called Super Forecasters. So there's a lot of people out there that want to forecast the future. And, um, and I, I can easily fall into that trap, shall I say, um, because um, in a way it's, um, it's useful at the same time. I, I just remember being in the audience at Singularity University, a, a global summit there. And um, I've got a few friends involved in the, the Singularity University and a very good friend of mine founded the, the, the European side of it. And um, I remember just on this occasion, I wasn't a speaker. Um, I was in the audience and I was just sitting there and guys like Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamandis were talking and all these other folk. And it was kind of weird being told, this is the future, get with the program. And then I'd looked around and I saw all these corporate sponsors on the sides and I thought, oh my God, I'm feeling actually a little bit disempowered by this being told what the future is. It's, it's already been colonized uh, by a bunch of people. And, and so I think the field of prediction is an interesting space. I, I do do it. I dabble with the, the dark art um, of, of, of prediction, but I also think there's a, a danger to it. And so many futurists, talking about the different types of futurists, um, um, th there's almost a unanimous agreement that it's futures not future and so the best futures futurists look at scenarios look at at, 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 at possibilities and and preferable futures uh, one guy to look up is jim detour um out of the un university in hawaii um but he um he's an influential futurist uh in terms of the future studies uh, in the United States, and, and he very much was part of the movement from fu the future to futures. And a lot of the European um, futurists, um, because, I mean, think about climate change and the ecological crisis. There's a whole bunch of very dark predictions. Um, and, and then what do you do? You just accept that, um, or, do, or do we try and change the future? And so the, the Club of Rome, um, where I think I have one friend who's still there, um, Club of Rome famously wrote the Limits to Growth report, which uh, folk like uh, Joanna Macy and many others would point as a, as, a, as a major book in the history of humanity in terms of warning 
about the end of the industrial era, well, warning that the industri industrial era will, will kill us and our planet. Um, these guys, um, they, they did use some predictions and analysis, predictive tools, but they also presented an alternative future. Um, but I, I can talk to you more a bit offline about um, some uh, tools that, uh, for, for prediction. But yeah, there, there are, with, with AI now um, uh, and the ability to just soak up so much data, it does give us a lot more ability to foresee certain trends. Um, I, 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 I give you an example. I, I would often just walk into the bookstores and I have an amazing ability now to just scan entire bookstores and see the shift, the subtle shifts in nuance of which books, which genres of books are selling better, the new books, what, what, what's coming out, what's, how are things shifting? And of course with Amazon, so I used to do this before Amazon, um, Amazon comes along. I still go to bookstores because I, I like, you know, I like the tangible relationship with the book, but I can go on Amazon, uh, Amazon now and look at lots of lists of bestsellers and things. Uh, and it gives me a little bit of a feel for where consciousness is going and what the trends are. Um, I also have a friend um, uh, where we went to the, um, he goes every year, he's been going for like 24 years, but he's been going to the Rotterdam Film Festival and for 10 days just watches films, four to five films a day, just to absorb what's the, what's the zeitgeist. Um, and of course now with artificial intelligence, you can suck up so much data and and find trends and, and use it for predictive um, tools and, and memes, you know, what words are starting to circulate. I mean, I predicted that the word fu the futurist would, you'd see the word futurist more and more and, and I'm seeing loads more futurists now just because I thought things are gonna change so much and um, um, that Alvin Toffler, the futurist who wrote Future Shock uh, was gonna be right. Uh, that uh, we're all going to get, as the pace of change accelerated, we were going to get more shocked by the future in a way, uh, and um, that there'd be more interest uh, in the future and futurists. Um, but um, yeah, there, there's all sorts of technologies now. And um, of course, as, as you know, in, in the finance field, there, there's a whole bunch of companies like Renaissance, um, um, with, with uh, algorithms, but I still believe that the human mind is, is incredibly powerful. I mean, this comes back to a, a point I like to make to audiences that um, AI is not gonna come along and re replace us, that, that um, we have this immense capacity for creativity and intuition. And um, um, yes, you can argue that um, that deep mind beating the world's greatest um, player of Go, um, which was regarded as an intuitive, a somewhat intuitive um, game, uh, could could be the uh, the death knell for uh, uh, humans in the workplace. But I, I tend to completely disagree. Um, I uh, I think um, in a way the the beauty about you know, I sometimes joke about people freaking out about the robots are coming, the robots are coming, we're all gonna lose our jobs and stuff. But, but actually, um, how do you compete with robots? You don't become more like a robot, you become more like a human. And so the, the, the amazing thing about the, the AI revolution is, is actually it's gonna push us into, uh, into becoming more human which again is, is, is um, escaping from the industrial mindset and being cogs in a wheel. And um, even um, uh, Pinker wrote a book, my friend actually was citing it on Facebook that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I was gonna mention it actually, uh, where are we? 
So if I still go on my screen, I've diluted, uh, I think I've deleted it. But um, my friend on Facebook was, oh yeah, quoting a, something from Daniel, Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. Um, I'm not sure I like left brain, right brain, because I think ultimately we have to go, our, our intelligence comes from a deeper source than the brain. Um, consciousness is much bigger than the brain, but anyway, at, at least it's a start. Um, but, but I kind of like the, the six, apparently talks about six, cultivating the six senses. So one, not just function, but also design. Two, not just argument, but also story. Three, not just focus, but also symphony. Uh, four, not just logic, but also empathy. Five, not just seriousness, but also play. And six, not just accumulation, but also meaning. And uh, he called the first approach L-directed thinking. And um, the second approach R-directed thinking. Um, of course, people at CIS will know um, that it's not just about thinking, that there are forms of intelligence that are vastly more powerful than the, the cognitive. Um, so I'm on the same page with uh, Carl Jung that talked about the four ways of knowing. Um, and um, I've always believed that we have multiple intelligence from like bodily intelligence to spiritual intelligence. And um, I was listening to an interview with uh, between Michael Murphy, the founder of uh, Esselin and uh, Ken Wilber um, the other day and um, how uh, Michael Murphy went back through um, uh, history and started looking at what people would call as paranormal experiences. And uh, he, he doesn't like to call them paranormal because by calling them paranormal, um, we're saying that these are the rare exceptions, um, uh, but actually they're kind of normal. We just forgot how to do them. Um, but if, if you look at all these different fields, whether it's sportsmen or Tibetan monks who can meditate in, in the snow and melt the snow around them. Uh, and I think I was telling Somya the other day that I, I know how to do that. Um, I, I mean, sitting on this Zoom call, I seem pretty normal, I think, but um, it's a technique that we can all, we can all learn. So uh, I, think, I think what's exciting is that we're, we're going back and remembering that we have all these amazing gifts that have, have been um, dormant inside us. Um, I think, um, I think uh, Rudolf Steiner would talk about this sort of slumbering faculties and intelligence that, that, that have been uh, laying dormant within us. Um, and, and to me, I've never thought of it as paranormal, perhaps because of all my weird experiences up in, in the Himalayas and the, the Korean mountains. I, I've seen a lot of interesting things uh, over, over the years, but, um, uh, and of course, um, precognitive experiences we didn't really touch upon, but um, I think a lot of academic futurists wouldn't really want to go there um, in talking about pre-cognitive pre experiences, but um, um, that I think is a reality. I've had it. I, I've had moments where I've absolutely had a glimpse of the future and it's happened. Um, I think perhaps uh, when I predicted a couple of things like Donald Trump becoming a US president, it came from a pre-cog experience I had and of course I was already looking at data and doing my traditional analysis at the same time um, but um, I think that's very exciting about the age in which we live that, that people are um, I think just 10 20 years ago they would have kept some of this stuff to themselves but now people are more widely talking about not just mindfulness, but their CEOs of companies are flying down to South America and doing ayahuasca and having experiences and other people are tapping in, into their, um, 
like I say, what, what some people would, would would regard as paranormal experience. So we're at a fascinating time. And um, I always like to argue with AI researchers uh, and, and when they say that AI is going to replace humans in all these different fields, I say, well, you're assuming that human intelligence remains static. And I think that's a load of baloney. I, I think um, that humans are at the, I guess, the, the, the tip of the spear of evolution. Um, and so we are evolving. And um, it doesn't mean to say we've not made a few mistakes since industrial revolution, but um, I, I, I like to think that we're on an individual odyssey and we're also on a collective odyssey. And um, I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and, and the hero's journey and, and my whole life. Um, it gives me goosebumps just talking about the odyssey because um, I, I think you look at all the best movies, the best selling books in, in history, they all involve the odyssey. Um, um, you know, you, you look at the, uh, take out the Bible and the best-selling books are like The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings, um, go, go through the lists. It's, it's fascinating how um, it inspires us so much, but because of the way society has been for so long, we're, we're fearful of, uh, of breaking the norms and, and going out onto our odysseys. So instead we 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 seek stability in our life but you know you know deep inside your heart and soul that you want to go out and do something and um and that's why i think um that human beings are i guess we're we're we, we're part of evolution we are um what what did barbara marx hubbard would call would say um we're all the universe incarnate we're the universe incarnate and um our job is um, is really to to promote uh, evolution and be creative. I don't know. Uh, do you guys study Tellard de Chardon? Um, Tellard, yeah, he's he's one of them. Yeah, he I mean, led to Barry in that Brian Swim lineage. Yeah, he said, um, "What was it?" Um, oh, I don't have my notebook, but I was rereading the phenomenon of man and and uh, he was saying that the 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 future christian he could have said the future human really needs to be someone with this sort of insatiable uh zeal for create creation um and we do have that um it was funny when i had my life life crisis my dark night of the soul I intuitively, um, I intuitively started to explore spirituality and psychology and, and all that stuff. But at the same time, I, um, like you said in, in the intro, I didn't go around and just meet uh, mystics and sages and Zen masters. I, I also went and sought um, creatives, writers, painters, um, Hollywood actors, um, because I, I felt that, um, that my creativity had been sapped uh, uh, in the corporate world. And um, I, I really needed to rekindle that. So I, I think it's a, a, a spiritual yearning with, within all of us. Well, thank you so much, Benjamin. This was really quite a dialogue and um, learned a lot about what it means to be a futurist. Um, and just before we end, I thought maybe you could um, uh, let everyone know maybe when your book is coming out, what, what's the title of the book? And just so we know. Sure, yeah, it's called The Futurist. Um, and it's it's uh, sort of part sci-fi, part real. Um, I'm sure you'll figure out which, which is which, but it, it's a dialogue. Um, a little bit like Sophie's world, but for the future. Um, and um, yeah, dialogue between the futurist and uh, this uh, younger woman. Um, and I won't say too much about the plot, but uh, yeah, it, um, 
it's I was actually when we arranged this call, I was hoping that we'd um, we'd actually have it up on um, Kindle for the the pre order. Um, but um, you know, books take a life of their own. Uh, certain things have I've had to uh, rethink or explore uh, more. So, um, but um, yeah, I mean, if you just if you follow my blog, um, if you just go on my website, uh, Benjamin J butler.com you can input your um, email address and um, I don't send out that many blogs I, I would like to send out more but um, um, there'll be updates there when, when it comes out um, relatively, um, reach out to me on um, social media as they say yeah thank you um, I know it's almost probably 5 a.m where you are so <laughs> thanks for you know taking time out of your precious sleep to be in dialogue with us today um, this was really awesome and and we hope to have you uh, come again no worries yeah it was a first experience at 3 3 a.m to 5 a.m and um, um yeah there was a time where i was waking up at 3 40 a.m um as part of my uh, meditative practice but um alas um that's not been the case recently. So um, it's a little bit of a shock for the system, but I, I just finally um, say as a pragmatic note to anyone else that listens to this, um, um, well, yes, it, it was a little bit of a struggle to, to sort of be talking at the level that I'd like to, to speak with you um, today, but um, that there are immense benefits to uh, cold showers and um, Cold, cold immersion and um, uh, for more details on that, uh, speak to Somya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or, or reach out to me, but uh, it's funny, this, th this call has um, coincided with me giving up caffeine again. And so um, I, I'm a, a week into not consuming caffeine, which um, uh, is interesting because if this had happened a week ago or two weeks ago, I would have just knock back um, uh, a few uh, a few coffees, and I'd probably be in a very different space. But um, nonetheless, um, I hope um, uh, the chamomile's done done us okay, and we've we've had some 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 useful insights. No, absolutely. Thank you, thank you so very much, and thanks to everyone who uh, came tonight. Uh, this is really great. Have a wonderful evening. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Ben. Yep. Very welcome. Very welcome.